I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we are back with our series on Lu Xun. We are looking at probably his most, I would argue, his most famous short story. I would argue the di- his maybe co-most famous, but yeah. I, I think I think it's maybe his most famous along with uh, the story of IQ, but because I like it more, I'm going to say it's more famous. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Today we're looking at the uh, Diary of a Madman, Kuang Ren Ruji. Uh, and this is kind of the story that launched the revolution. When I was taught this story at Nanjing University and at, at BYU, it was taught to me as the story that began modern Chinese literature. Like modern Chinese literature began with the publishing of this story, full stop. Yeah, that's the way I was taught too. Uh, there, are, there, I think... Ding Ling or someone else had a story that predated this chronologically, but did not hit the way this one did. So one thing that's important about this story that we have to point out is it's one of the earlier stories written self-consciously in Baihua, that is vernacular Chinese, as opposed to Wen Yan Wen. Now, th- you're right. There was another story. I don't think it was Ding Ling. It, it was published in, in Baihua. This begins modern Chinese literature both because of the language and because of the ideological uh, heft behind it. One way to read it is it's all about cutting modern China off from quote-unquote ancient China, the old China or whatever. We're going to try and try and twist that a bit. And folks who are already familiar with Diary of a Madman and Lucian will come away from this podcast. It's our hope. They'll come away from this podcast and the whole series thinking, mm, not exactly. Yes, and I want to set the stakes a little bit for us. Because as you say, if you've read any Chinese literature in the modern era, you've probably read this story. What fascinates me most about this story is that I can't think of anything else published alongside it that's anything like it. It's not like How this so? story... Well, I'll explain. It's not that this story kicks it off and there's a whole lot of imitators that follow. But when you look at a lot of the fiction that was produced around it, much of which was excellent fiction. This is not a question of quality, rather. Uh, Yu Dafu was writing at the same time. Ding Ling. They're all doing very well. I think Ding Ling's probably a good example, right? Miss Sophie's Diary, which is great. It's a great, great, great piece of fiction. You should all read it. But, but. none of it confounds us the way Kuang and Ruji does. None of, us, none of it presents these questions where you go, I don't know, man. That's I, This is how I would answer this question about this story. So the story that that it at least is purported to kick off the revolution is also the one that frankly is the hardest to interpret. And that fascinates me. So just a little bit of background. The story was published in April 1918. Uh, it's supposedly modeled on Nikolai Gogol's story, Diary of a Madman. Uh, Lushun was quite familiar with both Japanese and, and Russian literature. I don't, Rob, he didn't read Russian, did he? Don't think so. No, I think he briefly studied it, but that was it. So he's he's. I'm assuming he's getting his knowledge of Gogol either from a Chinese translation or a Japanese translation. He was quite quite an expert on Japanese translation, right? Yes, yes. He'd read a lot of Japanese translations. And for the for the listeners who don't know who Gogol is, Nikolai Gogol wrote the original short story Diary of a Madman. Same title, very different story. Uh, Lucian is not a hack. Very, very, very different. But also. Very satirical, very, frankly, bitter, and also kind of funny in the darkest way possible. So Lucian's story is like this. When you open the story, it begins with a preface, which is written in Wen Yan Wen, classical Chinese. Now, I know we already said that this story is the first Bai Hua, the first Chinese vernacular story. So it's weird even that it's has this preface that is in classical. What's fascinating is that the preface just says, I found, I, you know, I, I, I ran into this old friend. Uh, his brother had gone crazy for a little bit. He wrote this crazy diary. Ha ha. It's really interesting. He's all better now. <laughs> and then you descend into the diary and the diary is fascinating because essentially it accuses all of Chinese history of having several millennia of cannibalism, that Confucianism itself is cannibalism, and he believes that he is being uh, fattened up to be eaten, and that he finds references to cannibalism in so-called Confucian texts, and it's just a question of whether or not he's really mad. Now, as this is happening, there are some other things that indicate that the narrator of the the story, the novella, not the preface, 
uh, narrator. Those are two really different characters, and it's port- important to keep that in mind. The narrator of the actual novella is seeing funny things. He thinks the dog is talking to him. The neighbor's dog is talking to him. He thinks that the moon is particularly bright. This almost this kind of question is, does he have some sort of relationship with lunacy uh, in, in the way that he's talking about the moon? Uh, he thinks that the doctor is talking behind his back and talking to his brother about how to fatten him up. There's all this literally insane stuff that may or may not be happening. And the question that the story turns on is, okay, do you believe that China's entire culture is actually about eating people? And that's a question you, you can you can ask both literally and metaphorically. And why do you tr- who do you trust? Do you trust the narrator of the novella or the narrator of the preface? And that's really what I meant earlier about resisting interpretation, because having a solid interpretation of a story usually requires some kind of firm ground in the narrative. So I talked about Ding Ling's Miss Sophie's Diary earlier. That's a beautifully written story. It's also a diary, very much a diary. It's a fascinating diary, and it's a fictional diary, so far as we know, but it's very much a diary. So as you read it, you're never led to believe that the person writing the diary is fantasizing or imagining all this, or that there's someone exterior to the diary that may understand things a lot better and there's no reason to take it seriously, right? Diary of Madman does that. Where do you where do you start, right? As you read, you're sort of by by the, the way the narrative functions, you're sort of forced to take seriously what the writer of the diary says. But when you finish and you look back, there's no real reason in the story to trust the writer of the diary. And and there's no real reason to trust the writer of the preface either, right? When you come out of any sort of older tradition where authorial intent, where authorial authority, let's just use the word twice there, is super important, to just pull the rug out from under that is in many ways the real revolutionary move. Not necessarily the calling traditional Chinese culture cannibalistic or the thing that's destroying China and, and its ability to modernize, but Pulling the rug out from under an entire approach to reading is just crushing. So having taught this story several times, actually most of my students are from the PRC, I've noticed something very interesting. There are really two ways they read it. They either read it as, yes, the diary is correct, and this is a condemnation of old China, you know, the quote unquote old China and everything uh, about old Confucianism and everything that was keeping China back and keeping China from becoming modern or increasingly. And I think that this would have not been true 30 years ago with students from the PRC. They read uh, that preface at the beginning, which is written in classical Chinese, and they go, oh, yeah, that's the one that's right. Because if you have something that's written in classical Chinese and written in vernacular Chinese, the classical is more trustworthy. That's the thing. This not this novella is an epistemological question. It's all about how do you know who to trust? Do you trust the classical author, or the classical preface writer? Is that the one you trust? And that would traditionally have been the answer. But Lu Xun's implying that you can't trust anybody. And you're right, Rob. I think that is the revolutionary move. And it's 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 just fascinating how good this story is when you reread it it's it's also so so flipping modern yes it absolutely is modern and for me it's modern in the best way possible a lot of self-consciously modern literature is kind of grading sort of overly self-important this one and by now it, when you're if you if you've listened to the rest of our series you've heard us talk about Lucian's early career and you know that he started out very idealistic very committed to the notion that with the right book, with the right person speaking from their heart, all can change. Having jettisoned all that, this is this is the fruit of it. This is a story written from the perspective of someone who has been idealistic and thought things can change and then realized they can't, and then going, you know what's really going to make people change? Is if we force them to think about how you trust anything at all and don't tell how them do you read where something? to go. How do you read something? How do you read anything, Right. And this is this is why you well, you mentioned the word reread. I know we don't have to define the word reread, but when I think of great literature, for me it's the stuff I go back to and go back to and go back to. And every time I go back, 
I'm like, I, I still don't have a handle on this. And this is that story. This is one of those stories where every time I go back to it, something else leaps out at me. You know, part of the point of this series is to position Lu Xun as two things at once. As a great modernist writer in the vein of Proust or Joyce, but also the great Chinese writer as he's depicted. This is one of those stories where he's both at the same time, right? So if if you know nothing about Chinese history or culture, the Confucian accusation and cannibalism, it's going to be kind of weird. Like, what's the point of this, right? So he's totally Chinese in that. But after that, the way he yanks the rug out from under any traditional way to read a narrative is modernist to the hilt. And that he brings both of them together is genius. In, in other words... You can read this from a sort of China focused perspective, or you can read this from a part of the the global literary modernism movement and and he fits into both camps now we're going to talk about this more in a later podcast in the series when we talk about kind of Maoist interpretations of Lucian and post uh, Lucian's death uh, ways of viewing him. but I think that one of the problems. I have with the the Lucian after he dies is that the the communists take him and make him the patron saint of leftist literature. Now, he was a leftist. There's no doubt in that. What is fascinating, though, is that this story has a leftist reading. You can read it as he's just critiquing feudal China. And and that's fine. I think that's there. But you can't only read it that way. If you only read it that way, then this story becomes kind of like a interesting critique of of Chinese politics, and that's it. But yeah. this is the thing. I think that the way this story has been interpreted in the PRC has actually held Lucian back. We talked, I think, at the beginning of this podcast series about how we want folks to think of Lucian as a modernist along the lines of, you mentioned Joyce and Proust. I would also add Kafka. I mean, he is, he is China's Kafka, right? Like the the sort of way he's playing with reality here uh, in this kind of grotesque, carnivalesque manner is really fascinating. And you're right, Rob, it, it invites rereading because there is no right answer. The PRC reading of it is that there's one way to answer this question about what is Lucian about. And you and I disagree with that. Yes. And this story is uh, one of the earliest pieces we have of his where you see that on display. Maybe he really is the voice of modern China. Maybe he is the leftist writer par excellence or whatever, right? But he's also one of those writers who knows enough about the way reality works to know the moment you say you figured it out, you haven't figured it out. And every single one of his greatest stories has some element that prevents that story from being a simple argument. He always messes it up somehow. He throws a quote in that makes you go, wait, what is happening here? He tweaks a detail. He gives you a voice that shouldn't be there. Something happens to keep us from reading that story in a simplistic way. He He's consciously pushing readers away from simplistic readings. I'm totally fine with calling him sort of the great modern Chinese writer, the voice of the Chinese people. Fi- fi- find a phrase, right? That phrase is much more powerful when you realize that that voice was also someone who was profoundly self-aware and profoundly aware of the limitations of both his own ideas and the medium he was working in. If that's the voice of a people, that says something about that people that maybe they themselves and those of us talking with them don't even really understand. Yeah, I really question whether or not Lucian is the voice of the people because he's this you know, son of an elite gentry family, kind of like Cao Shui-Qin. The family is is in decline, but he has all of the, uh, I'm going to use the word today that that has a political meaning. Uh, he has all the privileges associated with being high class. At this moment when China is opening up to the world, he he is able to, unlike most most of his compatriots, he's able to study abroad. He wanted to go to Germany, but he he couldn't, but he was able to study abroad in Japan and he had quite a bit of experience there. I, I don't I don't think it's fair to call him the voice of the people, whatever that that means. But I do think that he is one of the greats of the twentieth century both in China and someone who is just one of the great writers of global modernism. Of course, I should clarify, 
by the people, I don't mean literally the proletariat. We get too deep into our communist terminology. The Chinese people writ large is sort of what I was going for. Sure. I should have said the Chinese people. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't buy the term either 100% just because I don't think you can have a writer who is that writer is just like, read this writer. That's all you need to know about those people. No, negative. I was just sort of playing on the idea that sure, if we sure. take it seriously, imagine what that would say about those people, right? We're going to get to more classics in the series, right? We, we've got the true story of Aku coming up. We've got an absolutely fascinating story that Professor Carolyn Brown, who we'll talk about later, mentioned it's called Soap. Anyway, some great stuff. And they all do what we see in Diary of a Madman, which is to give you something that prevents any ability to read that story simplistically or even just simply. Before we go, Rob, do you have anything we should be thinking about? Social media. Make sure you look us up. Twitter at Chin Lit Pod, Instagram at Chinese Lit Pod, Patreon, our beer money hub, at Chinese Literature Podcast, and of course, the, the Gmail account, Chinese Literature Podcast at gmail.com. We love getting emails, and we love having little debates and arguments. We've got some great stuff like that going over email. We, we, we enjoy the long form response if you ever want to contact us. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.